Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Vector. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to another great episode right here on IT Pro TV. You're watching the Cali Linux Show. I'm your host, Ronnie Wong, and today we're actually going into, well, active information gathering. Now, we've already talked about passive information gathering in a previous episode. Now we're going to explore the nature of active information gathering with, of course, Mr. Security himself, Mike Roderick. Mike, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, Ronnie. Glad to be back and excited because uh, we are, yeah, we're moving on into the active phase. Although I will say that we're kind of on the border of active passive <laughs> at this point, you know. We are, when we talk about passive information gathering, we're going out and we're getting publicly available information uh, through search engines, through who is databases, through social media, um, lots of good stuff there. But we're just getting publicly available information, right? IP addresses of DNS servers, um, network blocks that have been assigned to a particular organization. Once we've done our passive phase, we're going to start moving into the active phase. And now we're actually going to start hitting servers, right? We might be doing port scans. Uh, we might be interrogating that DNS server, which is kind of what we're going to look at here. We're going to start with uh, DNS and doing some, some interrogation there. Uh, but we are moving, as I said, into that active phase because now we're, we're going beyond what's normally publicly available, right? Anybody can go to uh, Google and search that information and find, like what we were showing in previous episodes. But if I start querying DNS servers and pulling back MX records and NS records. Again, this, this is why I say it's kind of borderline because that stuff would normally be available anyway. Like if I wanted to send an email to that organization, that information has to be out there. But if it's a privately owned DNS server, right? Now we're going, we're, we're having to one, get to that DNS server. Um, so it, it is, like I said, kind of borderline active, passive, and we will move on into the full on active phase in a little bit. All right, so Ronnie, what are some tools we can use if we're going to do some, some DNS interrogation uh, or enumeration, I guess it would be a better word for it. Uh, what tools do we want to use? Uh, and there are several for this. But we're going to start kind of like we did in our passive with tools that are just built into just about every Linux system, including Kali. And that tool, the one I'm thinking of, is the host command. All right, so if we take a look at my screen here, I'm going to type in host. Did she pull it up quick enough to see my typo? It's all gone and I can't spell host. Uh, if we type in host, we'll see that there are a few different switches uh, that go along with this command. Just a uh, few. Just a few. You can also do a man, I don't know what I tried to spell there, host. Uh, and you can get a lot more detailed information on how to use uh, this particular command. All right. I'm going to quit out of that, clear up my screen, and let's just see what we can use. Um, actually, let me do host one more time. There's a couple of switches that I'm going to start with here. Lowercase t is for type. And this tells it what type of record you're trying to retrieve. All right. For example, if I want to find out the name servers of IT Pro TV, well, I can type in host dash t ns for name server uh, and then itpro.tv. And there we go. We get uh, four different DNS servers uh, that are hosting the itpro.tv zone. And quick and easy, right? Could we have gotten this information from who is lookups? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, other sources as well. Uh, multiple tools to do the same thing. Always good to have a, a choice when it comes to finding this information. And plus, this one is focused in on just that DNS info, uh, so very, very quick. Uh, what else can we look for? Maybe I want to find out if they've got any mail servers, uh, what the IP address is of their mail servers. Host-TMX for ex mail exchanger. Uh, and there I get itpro.tv or itpro-tv.mail.protection.outlook.com. Uh, didn't give me, I would then have to go back and look up IP address for um, that, but it gave me a um, um, Oh, okay. a qualified domain name. Thank you, Ronnie. <laughs> and FQDN is the word that was not coming out of my mouth. All right. Uh, let's do some more here. Let's do, what if I do host www.itpro.tv? All right. We'll get back. Itpro.tv is an alias for itpro.tv. 
gives me the IP address of their web server, and again, it tells me who is handling their mail. Okay, that's good information. Uh, what if I picked one that was invalid? Let's do host nada.itpro.tv, and I get nothing. So what we're seeing here, right, when I do host www.itpro.tv, I'm really trying to guess a host name, right? We look at the itpro.tv is my DNS suffix. That's our domain. What occurs before that, assuming I'm sticking at that, at that uh, root domain, www is a host name. Well, it's an alias in this case. I don't think we actually have a host name, www, but you get the idea. So I could put anything I want there. If I want to see, maybe they've got a machine named server22.itpro.tv, right? And it would go out and it would query the DNS server and see if it could return an IP address. Right? That's the whole idea here, is I, I'm trying to get information about their machines, uh, getting their IP addresses so that I can then start doing whatever's next in my attack uh, cycle. But me guessing names like that is tedious. I'll sit here and type in, okay, they don't have a nada.itpro.tv. Uh, maybe they have a host uh, server.itpro.tv. Oh, nope, they don't have one of those. And I could keep going and going and going. One of the cool things that we can do with Bash in a command like host is we can actually automate the process. What I can do is feed in a list of names so that I don't have to try them. Because um, what are some common names we might think of for publicly facing servers? Mail. Yeah, mail. A lot of people have mail.itpro.tv or mail.yourcompany.com or whatever the case may be. Uh, proxy is another common one. OWA is a Web. common one. Web is a common one. And we can start mangling those. Web01, Web02, Web03, Mail01, Mail02, Mail03. So we can take what we call a dictionary file, a word list, which is simply one word on each line, and we can feed it into that host's command and say, hey, try this, try this, try this, and if you find it, give me the IP address of those machines. Right? So basically what we're doing is we're brute forcing host names on a domain using the host command. Now to do that, we're going to need a word list, which I have uh, created one called hostnames.txt, and I simply put a few in there. In the real world, I break out my dictionary files. You can go out and do a search on the internet. Uh, you can look for common host names or host name, host name dictionary file or whatever. You can build your own based on your own experience. What are some common names? And I simply put one word on each line. All right. So now I can type for name in dollar sign open parentheses cat hostnames.txt. Oops. You cannot use your tab autofill when you are writing like that. So <laughs> let me get out of there and do that one more time. Uh, we'll do for name in dollar sign open parentheses cat hostnames.txt. Do not autofill that, Mike. Close your parentheses. Um, so I'm saying for each name, or, and you could put for, for this right here, for name, I could put anything I wanted. For, each, for Mike in, it's saying for each line in that file, hostname.txt, we're going to call it name. So grab the first line, the first name, right, in hostname.txt. And then we're going to say do host dollar sign name dot Microsoft dot com. Right? So I'm saying for each word in this file, run the command host, whatever word it is, dot Microsoft dot com. So the first word in my list was www. So it's going to do host www.microsoft.com. Then it's going to go to the second word in there, which I think is proxy. And it's going to say host proxy.microsoft.com. So you see what I'm doing? Instead of me typing each one, host, let me think of something, server01.microsoft.com, I'm just going to take this word list and pipe each one of those words one at a time into that command. Put a semicolon on the end there and put done, and let's see what happens. And there we go. All right. So let's look at the results and see what we've got. Um, we see Microsoft.com is an alias. So www is the first one in my list. It says it's an alias for Microsoft.com, yada, yada, yada. Um, found some more www's. Uh, ooh, look there. It found one mail.microsoft.com 
and there's an IP address. I might not have known about that, but now I do. There's another one. They've got two mail servers out there. Ooh, look at all the OWA servers they've got. Several different IP addresses for OWA.Microsoft.com. And so this is how we can start brute forcing names, host names, on a particular domain. Right? Um, now, another cool thing about host, besides using a word list like that and looking for known names as far as host values go, another thing we can do is we can do it the other way around, and we can do IP addresses. Because remember, when we were doing our uh, passive information gathering, a very common thing to obtain is the IP address block that's been assigned to a particular organization. Through those who is lookups, uh, we can obtain that information pretty easily. Now, I don't know what host they've got on in that block, but we can find out, right? And we can use host to do that, and we can actually automate that process as well, right? Um, let me show you what it looks like in the, actually, you know what I'll do? Um, let's run that command again for uh, Microsoft.com. Um, and I'm seeing, I'm just going to cheat. Now, I could, could go back and run a uh, who is and find other blocks. We're just going to grab this block right here. I can see that there's three different addresses on there, and there potentially could be more. Right? I'd like to find out. All right? So what we're going to do, if we just wanted to run the command host um, 131.107.1.89, uh, and we hit Enter. Here I can see it's doing a reverse lookup. It's taking that IP address and it's turning it back into a domain name, all right, or a DNS name, I should say, a fully qualified domain name. That's what we want to do, but we want to go through every single IP address in that block and see if there's any hosts that resolves uh, any host names we can get out of that. So for that, we're going to do something very similar. Let's clear up that screen a little bit. We're going to do for IP uh, in dollar sign, so just like we did earlier, open parentheses, but here instead of catting that hostnames.txt file, which had one name on each line, we want to cycle through IP addresses. Well, I don't have to go out and make a file with one IP address on each line. I can actually use my sequence command to roll through a uh, consecutive sequence of numbers. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to type in sequence 1 through 254, All right. uh, and I'll put a semicolon. So basically what I just did was sequence 1 through one, 254 is I made a, in a sense, you can think about it like making a file with one number on each line, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way down to 254, right? So a list of numbers, 1 through 254. Now we're going to do our host command, All right. Uh, and the IP address is 131.107 dot one dot and this is where I don't know right I want to go one then I want to try two and then I want to try three so we can put in our dollar sign IP for that last octet and then semicolon done now I'm gonna add something here and this you know just because you've run this before and you've seen the results remember when we were I said let's try nada.microsoft.com and it said host not found didn't give me a valid IP address well, now I know in the output, if these IP addresses don't resolve back to a host name, then I'm going to find the word not found in there. So we're going to go ahead and grep that out so that our results are just IP addresses that actually resolved back into host names. All right? uh, so we'll do a little grep dash V and then in quotes, not found and end my quote. And we'll hit enter. An invalid, oh, it doesn't like what I typed there. So let's see, for IP and dollar sign, let me check my notes. Uh, for IP in dollar sign sequence, I did all of that to get my semicolon. Huh. Why did it not like my invalid floating point argument? One through 254. You know what, I think I... Um, uh, that was my mistake. I put a dash in there, just a habit for typing ranges. Uh, I'll go back and I'll show you that command again. Let's go ahead and let it run through this. Uh, should be about 254 possibilities, so it won't take that long. And there it finished.
Let me go back up and show you what I did wrong, my typo in that command. When I set up my sequence, I did a one dash two five four. Uh, leave that dash out. Here's the correct way to do the sequence command. First value space, last value. It's not like nmap or any of those where you put the actual uh, hyphen in there to do the ranges. All right, and then you can see what it's doing. It's taking each one of those addresses, right? And it's saying, all right, let me see if I can resolve that to a name. It's basically doing a reverse lookup and look at all the machines that I found, right? Uh, mail, nse.microsoft.com, public.microsoft.com, a bunch of mails, uh, a lot of good stuff. There's an Outlook, uh, doghouse.exchange.microsoft.com. I'm sure what that goes to, but this is, again, information gathering, right? You're going to find that as you do information gathering, you're going to get information overload. A good majority of the information that you get back will probably turn out not to be all that useful. But if I don't find all of that and whittle it down to what is useful, I don't, and that's probably not the best way to say it, but I need to get all that information so that I can dig through it and find what's useful, right? So a lot of hosts that I might not have seen otherwise without doing this host command uh, with that reverse. Now, there was something I thought yeah, I was going to show you guys, but maybe not. Okay. Um, so there we go. There is using the host command uh, to brute force host names, right? We used a, you can use just the simple host command, or you can use a word list as an input, and we can brute force those. We can also use the host command to do reverse lookups, where we take an address block that we know is assigned to an organization, and we can find out what hosts exist on that block, simply by running a little bash script and feeding each one of those IP addresses into that host command. All right, Ronnie, so there again is our, our simple little host command. Now let's take a look at a couple of tools that we can use. And we'll do a quick look here, and then we'll do an in-depth look in their own episode. So the first one we want to do is DNS Recon. Right? So we'll type in DNS Recon. I'm going to blow this up just so we get a better look at it. And you can see the, the syntax is simply DNS Recon and then my options. Right? And as far as my options go, um, the little d is a good one to know. That is my target domain. Right? Who are we going to try to recon? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What else do I want to show you? Uh, dash N for the name server. All right. And then dash T for type. Those will be the three switches we'll focus on here. So what DNS recon allows me to do is it, it will try to do queries, right? It can return. Just like we did with the host command, I can go out and get the MX record. I can go get their NS record if it's available on that DNS server. But another thing that DNS recon will do that we don't do with that host command is a full-blown um, zone transfer. A zone transfer in the DNS world is a DNS server hosts a portion of the namespace. Um, and a zone file are all the records that exist within that namespace. So for example, here at IT Pro TV, that'd be you know, Ronnie's laptop.itpro.tv. There's an A record in there that has its name to IP address. Other things you find in the uh, DNS zone, uh, which we should be familiar with at this point, are, are MX records, uh, aliases, SRV records, uh, help you find services, right? Service locator records, uh, SOAs. Um, gosh, what else can I find in there? All kinds of, uh, of good stuff in there. But anyway, a zone transfer is I want to get a copy of that file, right? And if a bad guy can do a, get a zone transfer, a copy of your DNS zone file, it's a roadmap to your entire network. It's every machine's name and IP address, all of the aliases that those machines go by, what services are being run by what machines. I can now tell you the, exactly where your domain controllers are, where your name servers are, where your exchange servers are, because they've got SRV records in your zone file so that legitimate users can find those services. All right, so DNS Recon, uh, let's try it out. I've got a server that I've set up intentionally weak, so we're going to do DNS Recon. Uh, the domain name that I want to transfer, so dash D, be lab.itpro.tv. Uh, and then the dash N, the name server I wanted to use, is 10.10.1.12. And the dash T for type, AXFR. There's different zone transfer types, AXFR uh, versus IXFR. Incremental 
is just the changes since the last replication. AXFR is the full zone, whether it's changed or not. Now, we don't have a previous replication, so uh, IXFR really wouldn't do us any good anyway. We want the whole zone file. So we hit Enter, and there we go. Testing NS server for zone transfer, checking for zone transfer for lab.itprochat.tv. Uh, it's found the IP address, right? It's verified. There's the start of authority, telling it who the authoritative DNS server is. Uh, it removes any duplicate IP addresses, and then it starts hitting each one. So if there was more than one NS record found in that zone file, it would do this for each DNS server. It would attempt to do a zone transfer. Here I can see 1010.1.12 has port 53 open, and then it says, yay, zone transfer was successful. And then as I scroll down through these results, I can see all their NS records, I can see all their A records, and again, most importantly, um, to go along with those A records, all the SRV records telling me who's running Kerberos, right? Who their global catalog server is, basically who their domain controller is. It's a little teeny tiny domain that I just set up a little bit ago. It's got one server and a couple clients. Uh, but the point is, is I was able to transfer that entire zone file using uh, DNS recon. Now, Ronnie, I'll tell you that, that most of the time it's not going to be quite that easy, right? Mm -hmm. Um, they're not going to let us. Like, if I go back over to this server, I can show you. Uh, let me log in real quick. I'll open up DNS. And I'm going to pull up the properties of that zone. And on that zone transfers tab, I allowed zone transfers to any server. I'll tell you, this used to be the default back in <laughs> server 2000. Um, and you will find, unfortunately, we still find servers set up this way to this day because somebody has figured out, hey, it doesn't work. If I just allow zone transfers to any server, everything seems to work just fine. Yeah, well, that's not a good thing. If they had left it on the default to not allow zone transfers or only servers listed on the name servers tab or only the following servers, let's see what that does to my recon ng. Try that same command again. Zone transfer failed. No answer or reset. It is not going to allow me to have that zone transfer. All right. Um, so just an example of one of the things we can do uh, with DNS recon. Another tool that we want to take a closer look at uh, is DNS enum. Just another tool for interrogating or enumerating DNS. All right. Lots of options here. I like this. Note the brute force capital or dash F switch is obligatory, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see what we can do with DNS and um. DNS, uh, let me clear that screen up, get back to the top. Uh, DNS and um, and let's pick on uh, ufl.edu again, All right? So what this is doing is it's basically doing a lot of the stuff that we would do manually with something like host uh, and trying to do zone transfers that way. You can see it's uh, gone out and it's found an IP address for ufl.edu. And then it did some queries and it found the name servers and their IP addresses. Also found all of their mail servers. And then it's trying for each one of these name servers that it found, it's trying to do an AXFR or a zone transfer from that DNS server. So NS refused, RNS also refused. Right? Uh, and then it says brute force file not specified because I am not trying to brute force anything just yet. Um, we can do we can add an enum switch to this command, which gives me a little more information. If I type in DNS num dash enum and then uh, ufl.edu, right, you see it adds a little bit to it. Right? Not only does it go out and get the uh, name servers, the mail servers. Again, it's just looking at those NS records and those NX records. Uh, then it tries the zone transfers. And then scraping ufl.edu subdomains from Google. And so it's actually going out and trying www, seeing if there's any um, uh, subdomains, you know, stuff that would appear to the left of the ufl.edu. And it found www.purchasing.ufl.edu and www.honors.ufl.edu. So it's finding those for us here in the Google results. Uh, again, I can see a lot of the same stuff and the IP addresses that go along with those. 
just more information than I can add to my research as I am doing that research on my uh, target. Or if I am a, a security professional uh, trying to find out what information is out there, I can look at this and go, wait, hey, why is this available? How can I uh, hide this stuff? Now that whole brute force thing is just like we were doing with the host file. You feed it a word list. Here it's searching Google, right? Like we did with some of the previous tools, it's just trying to see if it can find anything.ufl.edu. But I can provide a word list for it, and it will try those as well. So let's try a DNS and um, and we'll do a dash F, and then that same file, hostnames.texts, uh, and then a dash R, and the URL that I want to brute force, ufl.edu, and see what we come up with this time. Right. So now, rather than scraping Google and just randomly trying to find stuff, it just used the names out of my hostnames.txt. So I can see it found a UFL or www. Uh, it found mail, and there's a couple of their mail servers. All right. Um, so there we go, Ronnie. Uh, three different ways that we can do some basic information gathering on DNS. We got that host command that we can find from within Linux. Uh, and then, of course, Kali has our wonderful selection of tools. We've got DNS and NUM as well as DNS Recon. All right, Mike. Well, thank you again for helping us to at least learn a little bit more about these tools. We're going to dive into some of them a little bit more uh, intensely, uh, I would say, uh, in a future episode. But this is a good taste and a good understanding, at least, of some of the active ways that we can start gathering some more information. But that means that this is another great episode that we are going to end right now. Signing off for IT Pro TV, I'm your host, Ronnie Wong. And I'm Mike Roderick. Stay tuned right here for more Cali Linux shows. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.